musical linguistic objects. Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And uh, special greetings to some of our fellow saloners who have sent in donations to help with the expenses associated with these podcasts, either by sending a direct donation or by making a donation for my uh, Pay What You Can audiobook, my novel, The Genesis Generation. And these generous souls are uh, longtime salon supporter Mark C., uh, Allison S., John B., Neil R., Kenneth M., and John N. And uh, I thank you all ever so much. Also, uh, I should mention that, uh, yes, I am very aware of the issues associated with PayPal right now. And uh, in time, I'll set up some other ways to donate. In fact, uh, I've spent quite a bit of time looking into the various other payment setups, but it's going to be quite a while before I can uh, find the time to do all of the uh, back-end work to set up the implementations of them. Not that they're all that burdensome, I guess, but uh, it does take time, and uh, to tell the truth, I've kind of gotten out of my geek mode for a bit here, and uh, in fact, uh, I haven't even taken the time to set up a new online bookstore now that Amazon cut off uh, all of us associates here in California. And also, uh, there's the issue of uh, using some new tools to reduce the file sizes of these podcasts, Uh, not to mention several other things that need to be done on my websites, but until I kind of get out of these dog days of summer where I'm just kicking back and doing a lot of reading, which I'm enjoying immensely, by the way, I'm going to... uh, probably continue putting off uh, most of those little projects, uh, at least until I finish uh, writing, uh, along with Bruce Damer, our presentations for the upcoming workshop that we'll be leading at the end of September. And I'll say more about that after we hear today's program. Now what we're going to hear right now was actually never intended for public consumption because it was recorded only as backup for an interview that Peter Gorman did with Dennis McKenna in uh, 1994 for a magazine article that Peter was writing. And I'll tell you the story of how this interesting recording came into my possession uh, right after we hear the first part of this interview. In fact, uh, I've got a whole lot of things that I want to tell you, and uh, that's mainly why it's taken me so long to get today's program out. Uh, I simply didn't know where to start, and uh, it seems like so much stuff to cover that I don't really know where to end either. But first, uh, let's get to the program, and uh, a little more introduction, I guess, is in order right now to kind of set the stage for it. If, like me, you recognize the name Peter Gorman, but can't quite place where you heard it, That's probably because uh, Peter is a very prolific writer whose work appears in many publications that you've no doubt read at one time or another. And I'm going to include some links to Peter's work and his new book uh, in the program notes for this podcast. And in my next podcast, I'll be telling you a little bit more about some of the things that he's involved in. His new book, by the way, is titled Ayahuasca in My Blood, 25 Years of Medicine Dreaming which uh, I personally am looking very forward to reading before long. In fact, uh, if we can eventually work it out, I'd love to have Matt Palomari interview Peter for a podcast uh, specifically about ayahuasca. But I guess those speculations should wait for now while I get back to uh, introducing this program. In my case, I first learned of Peter during the years when he worked for High Times Magazine, uh, including a stint as its editor. And uh, after we hear the first part of this interview, then I'll tell the fascinating story of how this recording reached me. But first, let's join Peter Gorman and Dennis McKenna in a quite candid conversation sometime back in 1994 that begins with some stories of the early years of the McKenna brothers. However, uh, for many of our fellow saloners, the most interesting parts of this interview may be the story of the uh, long and winding trail that Dennis took on his road to becoming one of the leading intellectual and academic lights in the psychedelic community. In particular, his uh, story may be of help to some of our fellow saloners who are still in the early stages of starting out in life and uh, want to follow the psychedelic research path. So let's get started and uh, learn some McKenna family history from the mouth and mind of the McKenna brother who even Terrence admitted was the source of many of his best ideas. This is a good time? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. How long do you think it'll take? It's just 38 pages of questions. Oh, um, 
<laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Tell you what, let's start. Uh, let's start with your basic background. You know, okay. uh, what kind of family, where you grew up, what kind of what you wanted to do when you were a kid. Uh, how many is Terrence your only brother, or are there others, and that sort of thing. Right. Right. Well, uh, uh, we grew up uh, in a small town in Colorado, uh, and uh, in western Colorado, and uh, there were only the two of us. There was Terrence and myself, much to my parents' relief, I'm sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had a pretty normal family, really. I mean, my the town we grew up in is the town that my mother was born in and grew up in. My father traveled for an electrical uh, equipment uh, seller, and uh, you know, so he was he was a traveling uh, sales representative for a company that was based in Denver, but we didn't live in Denver. Uh, so, like that, I guess we had. Uh, an early interest in the peculiar. I remember Terence was uh, always had early interest in in science. Even before he was ten years old, he had an extensive rock collection and shell collection. And, and uh, he and my father worked on uh, model rocketry. That was a big interest of his. And being uh, four years younger, I was of course influenced by all this. Mm -hmm. And uh, to some degree, you know, found my own interest too. My big interest when I was a kid was astronomy and cosmology and that sort of thing. But I was always uh, poor in math. So I, although I wanted really to be an astrophysicist more than anything, I didn't think I had the math to to uh, to handle it. So I uh, sort of, as I grew up and began to uh, get my education, I, I sort, of, sort of shied away from math and physics and became more inclined towards humanities, uh, things like religious studies and anthropology and that sort of thing. And then only later did I really get back into the, the sciences from, you know, from the standpoint of biological sciences and that sort of thing. So, uh, but I, I think I think a early big influence on on both Terrence and myself was that we were both avid science fiction readers, and uh, I think my father can be blamed for that because he was occasionally a science fiction reader and used to bring home copies of things like uh, Fate magazine and Amazing Stories and, and that kind of thing, which influenced us when we were when we were much younger, and then we both uh, had an interest in science fiction and, and uh, you know, liked, I guess, to stretch our minds in, in terms of imagination and that kind of, that kind of thing. And that was really the motivation or the, the fascination with my interest in cosmology. I was, I was interested in astronomy, and I, would, I had a telescope. I'd go out and observe the heavens, but I also enjoy reading uh, authors like uh, George Gamow, who wrote a book, One, Two, Three, Infinity, uh, which talked about cosmologies and the origin of the universe and the structure of the universe and all these topics I found extremely exciting because it seemed like the, they were the big questions, and I was definitely interested in the big questions. Why are we here, and why is the world here, and what's it all about? that kind of thing. So I had a kind of a metaphysical inclination that was tied to this link and linked to the link to this interest in cosmology. Um, for for detail's sake, although it's not as interesting as what you're saying, what uh, give me a year on your on your birth and a town name if you can. The year of my birth? Yeah. Nineteen fifty. Okay. And the town was uh, Paonia, Colorado. Okay. Just -A -A. something. All right, something for the intro deck to right. kind of ground us. Right. When um, uh, your later interest in psychedelics had to begin somewhere, did right. it begin like a lot of us who are that same age? I'm 51. Uh, 
with you know smoking marijuana. What was your early drug experimentation? Well, I really think I really think that the early interest did come out of this interest in the large questions in the in the uh, you know in the in the metaphysical questions that to which there may not be answers having to do with you know who we are and the origins being in, in the world and, you know, is there a God and that sort of thing. I mean, I think of an early um, strong influence on both of our lives was the fact that we grew up Catholics. And although our parents were not uh, fanatical or devout Catholics, they were they took it fairly seriously. So we had a lot of early influence from the church. Mm-hmm. And uh, but when I got to be around 12 or 13, I found a lot of the answers that I was getting from Catholicism were not really very satisfying. I was reading some of the uh, philosophers who kind of questioned some of the tenets of Catholicism, Bertrand Russell and so on. So I was looking for some answers and also uh, some personal experience. I was I was interested. Another um, book that early influenced me, which I read many times, was H.G. Wells. Uh, a novel, The Time Machine, and I was just fascinated by the idea that you could, that you know, of time travel and being able to go to these places. So when I, uh, parents being four years older than I, when he went to uh, Berkeley, the first year that he came back from college at Berkeley, uh, we taught, we had long discussions about phenomenology and Jungian psychology and archetypes and the collective unconscious and, and uh, uh, realm of study called psychophysics. And these were all things that he was discovering at the time as a student in Berkeley, and this was about 1960, what would it be, 1965, I guess. And so he was excited by all these things, and when he came back, shared them with me. Um, I don't want to say that all of my intellectual development was due to him, but certainly the books that we were both reading at the same time and the ideas we were sharing were a strong influence. And so I was became quite fascinated with the idea that you could, you know, that there were other dimensions and that you could explore other dimensions and uh, that the psychedelics were one way to do this. That, uh, you know, it wasn't just, a, they weren't just drugs because I, I had... Uh, pretty much swallowed, uh, I, I'd been exposed to the uh, drug uh, education or more drug uh, uh, misinformation that students at school were, were exposed to uh, at that time, and, you know, I had a, a real horror of, of drugs, so I never thought of myself as being, you know, someone who would, who would get involved in that because I, you know, I believe the movies like Reefer Madness and that sort of thing that they used to show in the school. So that was not a great, that was not of great interest to me, but the idea that these were, that you could use these to actually um, explore other dimensions, uh, real worlds that were outside the cognizance of, of our ordinary world is really, I think, what fascinated me about psychedelics. Um, my uh, the, about the time that these, actually several years later, but R. Gordon Wasson's um, uh, article in Life magazine about seeking a magic mushroom had come out in 1957. I was a little young to appreciate it at that time, but a few years later, I uh, certainly was interested in, in uh, the publicity that things like LSD were getting in, for instance, Life magazine. And the publicity at that time was not entirely negative. And, you know, a lot of people were fascinated. There was thought that these, these things were exploratory tools. And so I was interested in, in that. About the same time that the uh, news about Morning Glory seeds broke into the national media. So this was actually my first encounter with the psychedelic experience was through uh, ingestion of Morning Glory seeds, which I could just buy at the local at the local seed store, and a friend and, and I uh, bought some some packets of Heavenly Blue and, and ingested them. Um, later, it 
turned out that the dose was really much too small to do anything, and the taste was quite horrible, and not a whole lot happened, or what happened was probably out of suggestion. But anyway, that was my first uh, encounter, really, with the psychedelic experience on a personal level. Mm -hmm. Did you go back and do the morning glory again? <laughs> Did I do it again? That oh, The morning glory, yeah. Huh? Did, the morning glory. Did you do not, that again? The... Not till years later, actually. I, I did it uh, several years later. I actually had the number of uh, encounters or experiences with Wyan Woodrose, uh, which is a much stronger form of the same thing, as you know. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really get into that until I was in college. Um, so that was several years later. My next encounter was uh, through marijuana, through um, again, Terrence was a big influence here because he came back from Berkeley one summer with uh, with his girlfriend and a lid of uh, what we probably consider pretty inferior grass uh, in these days. But we passed a number of afternoons trying it out in the in the local uh, public park, which we have to live across the street from the from the city park in the town, so we just went over there and spread a blanket out under the tree. This was 1966, I believe, and it was not an age where people were aware of anything, so you could basically, you know, no one would look twice at you. We pretty much just did it out mm -hmm. in plain view. The first few times I smoked it, not much happened, uh, but finally, I think marijuana is one of those things where you have to kind of learn uh, to you have to learn it, you have to know what to expect. But on the third or fourth time, it did have a definite effect, and then I began to see uh, what it was about, and, and you know what the. So that was really, I guess, my first real um, encounter with an altered state of consciousness. I actually, uh, well, other than alcohol, and curiously enough, the a couple of weeks. Before, before he came home, I was uh, was the first chance I ever had to get pretty shit faced drunk uh, at the at the local uh, at the Fourth of July dance. I was I was I went to the dance with a friend of mine, and I had to be taken home by the police. And as a matter of fact, I had to be taken home several times by the police because when I got home, I just walked out again and went to the dance. And, but actually, I didn't have a very good time. I was quite out of control when I, when I drank alcohol, and, and the contrast with marijuana was so different because there was no, uh, with, with grass, there was no desirable to do anything crazy or, or to run around and be obnoxious. It was, it was a much more interior directed kind of thing, and, and where, where alcohol just made me act stupid, what I was, uh, fascinated by with marijuana was the the thoughts, the very interesting ideas and thoughts that, or at least they seemed interesting, possibly they were trivial, but, so I thought it was a much a superior um, kind of intoxicant, and I, I actually it, it certainly early on became my drug of choice, <laughs> and and as, as a recreational thing, and, and to this day I don't have much interest in alcohol, and I don't really enjoy the alcohol intoxication. I, you know, I drink an occasional beer or glass of wine, but I, I certainly don't seek uh, that state of mind. Mm -hmm. When did you move into ethnobotanical work? Well, it, it happened, it really happened over a period of time. Um, because of my early fascination with psychedelics and the fact that my earliest encounters were through morning glories, um, I became early on uh, interested in the uh, uh, tradition of use of, of plant hallucinogens in other cultures. I guess a lot of people's early experiences with drugs were different because they had no, if they grew up in an urban environment, they had no context in which to place the substances other than the context supplied by the 
the mass media of the day. So that was basically Timothy Leary and the mass media's, uh, you know, promulgation of these things was not really, didn't really emphasize the fact that these things had been used for so many thousands of years by in traditional cultures. But because of my uh, interest in morning glories and early reading of, of uh, things like Aldous Huxley's books, The Doors of Perception, and so on, I, I was aware that, that, you know, these plants were out there, and I sort of, uh, I guess maybe it was a certain innate good sense that told me that, you know, if you wanted to really explore these things, you should explore them through the plants rather than through the substances. So early on, I became interested in anthropology and the use of these things in traditional context. In fact, that was really what led me in, led me as a, an early, as an undergraduate in college to study uh, anthropology. I started out as with a double major uh, in anthropology and astronomy, uh, which is kind of a strange combination with a, with a healthy dose of, of philosophy thrown in. So I was really interested in the big issues, the philosophical issues and metaphysics and, and that sort of thing. So I started out, you know, with this kind of funny major in college, um, and uh, anthropology was, was part of it, and a lot of it was directed toward the anthropology of religion, because, of course, in, in the religious context is where these things are, where these things are used. So I was interested in comparative religious studies and actually was a major in that for a while. But I, all my studies really uh, in, in college were linked back to this interest in plant hallucinogens and, and this conviction that, you know, these were the tools for exploring other dimensions where, you know, where the real action was. Um, when I, after uh, Terrence and I, I took off a semester, in 1971, which was uh, just after my mother had died of cancer. She died in October 1970. By that time, I was in college, and the Vietnam War was raging, and I was definitely in the, in the counterculture. And, but, you know, Terrence and I had been for a couple of years planning uh, this trip to South America um, to investigate uh this orally active form of DMT, which we had discovered. And again, I have to say DMT has been probably the primary uh, influence in my life in, in fostering this fascination with, with psychedelics. But after we, after we took off this, after I took off this semester, went to South America and had this experience, which, is, which Terrence has written about in, in True Hallucination, um, I came back with the conviction that I needed to become more involved in the sciences. I needed to learn more about botany and biology. While not giving up anthropology and the religious studies, I became more interested in, I guess, the nuts and bolts of it. And I think part of that was a, was a, a feeling that we were up against a in South America, we were up against a paradigm, we were up against a mystery, which it was very difficult to apply scientific methodologies to, and I realized I didn't really know what scientific methodologies were, and I couldn't really say that science was, was inadequate to approach these questions, because, uh, you know, I flattered myself that I knew something about science, but I had very little real scientific training so I felt a lack in my education. So I thought, you know, I, I wanted to go more in this direction of learning. I mean, I kind of drifted from an interest in the, in the I, I'm still interested in the, the ethnomedical uses of hallucinogens, the, the metaphysical and shamanic uses, but I felt I needed to know more about the plants themselves, their chemistry, the way they worked in the body, that sort of thing, because these are the issues Grappling, grappling with down there. I'm going to plead um, embarrassment and say that uh, while I have true hallucinations, yeah, uh, <clears throat> I uh, I read about the first 30 pages uh -huh. and have not actually found the time to do it yet. Um, well, so you have to do 
us. I will do it. Okay. For the benefit, for the benefit, I have actually a signed copy from uh, Terrence. Uh, so uh, well, it, 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 it definitely is one. But tell, so tell us, uh, me and more, the readers, your experience. Was it the mushroom and ayahuasca, or separate, or? Well, uh, the the story is chronicled in True Hallucinations, and it's kind of a long story. But basically, uh, um, the the genesis of of all that was that Terrence and I were both. I mean, Terrence has introduced me to DMT, and he had discovered DMT, you know, in Berkeley in the '60s. And even at that time, it was a very, very rare thing. I mean, most everyone had known knew about LSD, and there was STP around, and so on. But DMT was rare. It was getting out to a very um, limited circle of people, even at that time. Because, I mean, partly because I think it's just not really a recreational drug. It's too profound. And, and we certainly thought that it was, you know, that compared to any, the DMT compared to anything else was more interesting, more amazing, kind of the quintessence of the psychedelic experience, but also a little bit scary, in fact, a lot scary, because it was so powerful and, and so abrupt and and so we, and another thing that we found kind of frustrating about the DMT experience, it didn't really, more than anything else, it seemed to be not an experience, not a drug, but a, a place, an actual other dimension that you that you were plunged into. And because we had this, this sort of metaphysical view that that's actually what these drugs were about, they let you access other dimensions, you know, DMT seemed the way to get there. And, but one thing that was, that was, uh, frustrating about DMT was, was because the, the, uh, the duration of the experience was so short and it was such a, an abrupt break from reality that we couldn't really make any sense of it. It was like, you know, about the most intelligent thing you could say after a DMT experience was, my God, what happened? You know, so there was no real way to put it in context. So we thought that if there was some way that the experience could be prolonged um, or, you know, some, well, prolonged, basically, that you might have enough time in that place to get your sea legs, as it were, and to kind of poke around and, and see, see more what it was about. So there was, you know... Uh, we were looking at the ethnobotanical literature at the same time, and, and at the, about that time, an early paper by Schultes emerged uh, from the Harvard Botanical Museum leaflets, which was called uh, Varola as an Orally Administered Hallucinogen. Well, of course, from our previous reading in the subject, we knew that Varola was used as a snuff, and we knew that the DMT had, and other tryptamines had been identified as the active ingredients in this snuff, but this Varola, the orally active form of Varola, which was used by only a few tribes, the Witoto, among others, um, was was new. And as Schulte pointed out in that paper, there were there were interesting pharmacological questions because, as you know, TMP is not orally active by itself. That's why you have to smoke it, or in the case of the the snuff, you have to snuff it because it's not. It won't uh, pass through the, the intestines and the liver in the active form. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, this is really new, and nobody seems to know about it, and maybe this orally active form of DMT is what we're looking for. Maybe it is a prolonged, you know, a, a way to prolong the experience. So we determined, I mean, on, on basically fairly, fairly flimsy, grounds, I suppose, but we said, you know, we have to go to the Amazon and collect this orally active form of DMT. Well, when we got there, uh, and we went to, I mean, from Schult following Schulte's um, references and, and his work, we knew that La Chirera in the Colombian Amazon was the, was the center of, uh, of distribution of this Watoto hallucinogen, so we determined to go there, and incidentally, the, the, or perhaps not incidentally, I don't know, but the, the route that we followed was exactly the same route that William Burroughs had fall, followed some 15 years before, uh, and which 
when he wrote the Yahi letters. He, he, he went to the same area looking for Yahi. Mm -hmm. He chronicled that with Allen Ginsberg and the Yahi letters. But mm -hmm. we traveled essentially the same path and actually encountered many of the same people that he wrote about. But when we finally got to La Chirera, uh after many days' travel, uh, we encountered there a Colombian anthropologist whose name we had gotten. We were expecting to find him. We heard about him in Bogota, and, and we were expecting that he, that he would be there. And he was, Dr. Horatio Cartier was called, I think uh, his name is changed to Guzman in the book, but he was there with his English wife, and uh, he is a whole story in himself, but he basically uh, told us when we, to when we got there, our band of, of people, and it wasn't just Terrence and myself, it right. was a bunch of pretty outrageous looking people, um, he told us that, you know, yes, they know about, I mean, I know about Ukuhe, but you can't just walk into this village and start asking about Ukuhe. You're going to, you know, they're going to freak out because this is a big, supposed to be a big secret. And, uh, in fact, I think he was exaggerating a little bit. So he said, you know, you have to hang out, you have to be cool, you have to establish a relationship with these people, and then maybe, maybe you can mention Ukuhe without, without shocking anybody. So he was not at La Chirera. He was at the village uh, four days away from La Chirera, which was kind of our our stepping off point from civilization. So we said, well, okay, you know, we don't know. We'll just press on and, and take his advice into consideration. And we didn't we didn't know. We just said, well, we'll hang out and, and see what happens. But so when we finally got to La Chirera, as it turns out, about uh, it, it, La Chirera is a mission village and about uh, 300 acres in the immediate area of the mission village had been cleared of jungle and uh, had been, they'd introduced cattle, the white Cebu cattle into the area. So when we got to La Chirera, it turned out that there were Silasvi cubensis mushrooms growing in the pastures. Just basically everywhere you looked, you literally on the morning after rain you could not walk through pasture without kicking over these things. They were that abundant. And we didn't know anything about them. We knew what they were. We knew they were psilocybin mushrooms. We had had a, a previous, uh, very brief encounter with them on our way into the Amazon at a, in, into La Chirera at a town called uh, Puerto Leguizimo. We had a, a, a light trip, I guess, or our first trip Way. So we knew what they were, and when we got to La Chirera, we didn't really take them seriously. We thought, well, you know, these are here, this is nice, these will be great recreational psychedelics to play around with while we're waiting for the real mystery, the Ukuhe, uh, to, to reveal itself. Well, as it turns out, of course, the Ukuhe quickly got forgotten as uh, we started eating these mushrooms on a fairly, at first on a fairly regular basis, maybe two or three times a week, and then finally virtually every day, and eating large amounts and, and kind of becoming drawn into uh, a world where it was very hard to tell what was real and what was not, whether we were stoned or, or not. And, of course, many, many your ideas rising up from the unconscious, not least of which was the notion that we could actually perform an experiment that would uh, somehow, um, it's basically based on the alchemical model that we could somehow produce uh, a physical artifact which would, which would be partly made of mind and would actually be, in some sense, the ultimate, the ultimate artifact. Something that you could both see and be at the same time. I mean, I don't want to get into details of all that. People who are curious can read True Hallucinations or they can read The Invisible Landscape. Suffice it to say, it was a pretty crazy ideation. Um, and out of that, we 
did attempt to, to perform this experiment. Fully uh, do, as well as ego uh, inflation and a certain expectation that, that somehow together we were uh, on the cusp of history, on the edge of history, and that had our experiments succeeded, history as we know it would have ended. So there was certainly a lot of, you know, I suppose what, what you could call delusion or self-fulfilling prophecy going on. Uh, but when we did perform the experiment, uh, one of the consequences uh, was that I went uh, completely mad for about two weeks, two weeks or more, completely mad to an external observer, but completely within complete what I what happened to me psychologically and in terms of my behavior made perfect sense in terms of this experimental paradigm that we had set up. We had predicted that this would happen. And, uh, and in fact, although to the other people in our group who were not part of this experiment, I just appeared to be raving and completely out of control, Terence also went completely mad, but in, the opposite, in an opposite sort of way, where he became extremely focused on the environment, extremely focused on me while I was off hyperspace, literally traveling through through uh, hyperspace, but he could understand me, we could communicate to each other because we were participating in this in this fully uh, do, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, other people around there said, you know, these, these people are clearly, uh, you know, in serious trouble and they've, they've gone completely bonkers. Um, Fortunately, we were able to, there was no easy way to get out of, uh, of uh, La Chirera. There, I mean, there was a certain, certain people in our group were saying, you know, we, we need to get an airlift out of here and get into the hospital. And we were able to fight that off. And I've been eternally grateful that we were, because I think the last thing that I needed to have at that time was the intervention of modern psychiatric medicine. Um, what was actually going on, and what I still believe at this time, although it may sound e egotistical to say it to some degree, but what I actually think was going on was there was actually a shamanic initiation, a shamanic election was taking place. Uh, all the archetypal um, elements were present. The idea that you make a journey to the center of the world, to the center of the universe, that you're torn apart and put to back together in a, in a transformed manner, that you're not the same person you were when you left, uh, when you come back. In fact, you never really do come back. But that is that is basically what happens, and I think I, I think the paradigm of shamanic election, which you're familiar with, Peter, actually fits uh, what happened more than any kind of psychiatric interpretation. I mean, I really think that that's what went on, and uh, you know, so that happened, and uh, and it it was really there's no doubt that it was the pivotal turning point of my life. It, it basically it was a rite of passage for me. I was 20 at the time. I, I left when I left for the Amazon. I was I was a boy, no doubt about it. And when I came back, I was a man and uh, an initiated one mm -hmm. at that. And it sort of influenced my whole career direction because again, I came back with this conviction. I mean, the revelations that, that I had had uh, during this experience had a lot to do, uh, what I thought were insights, had a lot to do with an understanding of how nature works and how plants communicate with humans and plants communicate with other organisms in the environment and this whole um, perception about how the sounds and the chemical, uh, I don't know what the term is, tapestry or the chemical composition of the jungle really relate, it really regulates the whole biosphere. I mean, it was a pseudo-scientific understanding, uh, admittedly, but yet within that there were elements of truth. 
And in fact, uh, you know, a lot of our guesses and intuitions about the way things were have since been confirmed uh, by scientific discoveries. So in some sense, you know, we weren't entirely, it was, we, we weren't entirely disengaged from reality. I think the psychedelics really do give one, uh, particularly in the context of, of an intense natural environment such as the Amazon, they give you an insight into how nature works. And, and what is really going on, because I, I, you know, remain convinced to this day that plant hallucinogens and uh, and uh, plant uh, secondary chemistry is really a communication, uh, a means of communication, and, and a, a thing that ties the biosphere together. And I think there's certainly there's a, that's a much more current view today than it was 25 years ago when we were when we were having these, these revelations. I mean, I think now there are many scientists who would agree, and there's a lot more evidence for it. But I came back from the Amazon with this understanding that in order to to be able to uh, apply this scientific paradigm, or not really apply it so much as understand its limits, because we realized that you know, we were up against the limits of what science uh, could really elucidate. So I, I understood that I needed in, in order to understand its limitations, I almost had to become the enemy. I had to become a scientist in order to understand the limitations of science. So that really kind of influenced uh, my future academic directions, where I decided to study, understood I had to study biology, study chemistry, study botany and taxonomy and, and all these different things. Um, so that I could try to make sense of these perceptions because I just didn't have the intellectual tools to really, um, what's the term, uh, appreciate or, or fully understand these insights that we have, that we had at the time. So that was really what influenced my, my future uh, direction. I sort of left the, I mean, I maintained an interest in the anthropology, but I felt I really needed to supplement it with some nuts and bolts, uh, understanding of biology and chemistry and pharmacology and, and that sort of thing. The, you actually ended up, or am I wrong in thinking that your actual, your, your degree is in uh, ethnopharmacology? Well, technically, my degree is in botany. Uh, I mean, that's what it says on the, okay. on the certificate. It's it's in botany, but it was really ethnopharmacology. Was um, there work for you when you got out of school? This is now. I think there's more acceptance, but uh, of that as a field. Uh, ethnopharmacology. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. In some sense, I mean, not not as that, but I've always after I I finally got my PhD, I was able. I became kind of the world. I became a perpetual postdoc, which was not that unusual for people who graduated at the time I did. There were, you know, academic positions were drying up, and a lot of us were caught in a situation where, you know, we were, we would do a postdoc and then go on, do that for two years, and then find another one, and then find another one. So I paid my dues as far as being a postdoc and having, um, what was basically a very interdisciplinary type of degree. It's not like I had a, a single specialty that I could that I could take out and market. I couldn't say, well, you know, I'm a computer programmer, or I'm a medicinal chemist, or I'm a you know neuropharmacologist, because my interest spanned all of the, all of these things. But actually, I I don't regret my postdoc. Uh, my postdoc days because it gave me a chance to uh, continue this interdisciplinary orientation and work in several labs uh, where I was able to pick up experience, uh, professional experience, quite outside the the uh, that that I had been able to obtain as a graduate student. You know, I mean, it was as a postdoc really that I that I got involved in pharmacology. I had the opportunity to spend two years. Uh, at the National Institute of Mental Health on a pharmacology uh, traineeship uh, fellowship. And it was there that I learned 
most of what I know about neurobiology, and I was able to pursue my interest in hallucinogens from that area. Again, they, 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 all of this was, came from this desire to, I guess, to really understand how psychedelics works in terms of current paradigms. I mean, that my, uh, you know, the, the, the models that we had evolved kind of independently in our own independent uh, intellectual uh, space in which uh, I think ma mysticism, magic, and, and really delusion played as much of a role as science. I wanted to get beyond that. I wanted to understand what was understand what was understood about science within the current scientific paradigm. So my postdoc experience gave me a chance to do that. I might also say that as an undergraduate or as a graduate student working for my PhD, I was able to go back to the Amazon and revisit a lot of the issues. I, I was able to go back 10 years later in the context of, of being a doctoral student and actually did collect the survey and collected ayahuasca and, you know, didn't go crazy this time, brought the things back to the lab, you know, investigated them, carried out the program and, and published on these things. So for me, you know, I was able to actually make a professional contribution or sort of redeem myself professionally by, by being able to revisit these, uh, these issues that originally had brought me there and actually this time, you know, pull a PhD out of it and pull a, a bunch of publications out of it. And on a personal level, this was a, I guess, a, a second rite of passage for me in a certain way. I had to prove to myself you know, that I was really okay, that I recovered from my madness, if you will, and I was able to go back to the same uh, area on my own this time without my big brother, although he joined me later, but, uh, you know, it was just a very different uh, kind of experience where, you know, I was an anthropologist and an ethnobotanist. I was able to go out, make these collections, bring them back, the lab and investigate them and kind of demonstrate to myself as well as to the world uh, that, you know, I, I could do science, basically, and that I was not completely <laughs> dis, mm -hmm. uh, disabled psychologically or something like that. I mean, I didn't feel that I was, but to be able to actually do that uh, was a, an affirmation that I was okay. Did you mentioned, uh, you know, the Schultes earlier. Mm -hmm. Did a uh, couple of things. Did you either have contact with Schultes and discuss with him the idea of um, uh, I don't know, entheogens or DMT actually not being a drug but being a space? Uh, and what what did he think about that? Well, I had contact with, with Dick Schultes. Uh, actually, in 1974, when I was still an undergraduate student, I wrote to him, um, and I expressed an interest in coming to work with him as a graduate student. And uh, he wrote back and was very encouraging, and he said, you know, you should come out to Harvard and we should get together. And so at the time, I wasn't in school. I'd taken a couple semesters that, or actually, I guess I had gotten my undergraduate degree at that point, but I hadn't yet entered any kind of graduate program. So I, and I was working in a restaurant at a time at a fairly menial job, so I bought one of those uh, around the country uh, Greyhound tickets uh, that you could buy at that time. I think it was $60 for 60 days of unlimited travel, and I got on the bus. At Berkeley, I was living in Berkeley at the time, uh, where Terrence was also living. And uh, and at first, I went to uh, Louisiana, Hammond, Louisiana, where I had some friends, and where you could find uh, mushroom growing, mushrooms growing. Mm -hmm. So I went um, there and stayed with my friends. My idea actually was to go uh, collect a lot of mushrooms and, and sell them and make some money to finance my trip. Mm -hmm. But when I actually got there, it was very dry. Um, and so there weren't a lot of mushrooms around in the pastures. 
but there were enough that I had plenty for my own uh, purposes, but not enough to actually collect, uh, which was probably a good thing. But I, I spent about three weeks there, and I was eating mushrooms, again, quite regularly, uh, and having a great time, basically, sort of getting back in, making contact again um, uh, with this dimension, which is, which I haven't had the extensive contact with since La Chirera, since I had no access to mushrooms. So after three weeks there, I continued on my trip. I went to Washington and then eventually ended up at Harvard and saw Schultes, uh, spent uh, a day with him. He was very nice to me. And I, I told him of my interest in plant hallucinogens, I didn't really get into the metaphysics of it. He doesn't seem to be a person, I mean, he claims that these things don't do anything to him, and I I didn't really discuss that. We discussed more or less what the program would be, and, and at the time it looked like it would be some kind of taxonomic uh, uh, program to look at the taxonomy of Varola, because I was very interested in Varola as the source of the DMT uh, drugs. Um, so we we talked about it. And he said, "Well, you know, you really need to get more chemistry and more taxonomy. You you know, you're not as an undergraduate since I've had so much liberal arts and so little science." He said, "You know, it'll look a lot better on your transcript if you can say you've had a lot of taxonomy and and more uh, biochemistry." So I went back to Colorado and uh, went to Fort Collins this time, where Colorado State University is. And I enrolled, uh, I was already graduated, but I just enrolled in some, some summer courses. So I took organic chemistry and statistics and, and uh, some more botany courses, more or less to try to bolster my, my transcripts to get into Harvard. Well, uh, that was actually one of the best things I could have done because it turns out that the person who taught the introductory organic chemistry, uh, whom I've never seen since, but I'll always remember, his name was Dr. Frank Sturmitz, and he was a natural products chemist. And so I just was fascinated by his lectures. He was an extremely good teacher, and he would illustrate all his lectures by talking about all the psychedelics. And he'd talk about the biosynthesis like surgic acid and the biosynthesis of mescaline and these things and how how these things were formed in plants. And I just ate it up. I just love this stuff. And so he and I became good friends, or he became, we didn't become good friends, but he became, a, I guess, a valued advisor. And I also had a couple of advisors from, um, from the University of Colorado where I got my undergraduate degree, a botanist there, I also admired. And so I was in touch with these people, and, and I said, you know, I wanted to do graduate work in, in ethnobotany. And uh, uh, I was also an occasional, I had applied to Harvard during this time, I was an occasional uh, in touch with Schulte. And, but I was getting more and more, I was working at the same time uh, that I was taking courses at uh, CSU, I also uh, had a part-time job in a tissue culture lab uh, in the botany department next to the greenhouse. As it turns out, a very good friend of mine was at the time running the CS the greenhouses, the botany greenhouses at CSU. So he made some uh, space available in the lab for me. <coughs> and I was working on, at the time, trying to figure out how to grow the last bees. Uh, cubensis on rye grain in jars, and it was actually that winter, uh, the winter of 1975, that we made, that I made the breakthrough. I first got, I was in correspondence with uh, a friend uh, who we worked on it in Berkeley, but we were unsuccessful, but he uh, drew my attention to a paper from, I believe, Michael Logia, which gave a, a method for growing uh, Agaricus campestris, the, the meadow mushroom, on sterilized rye grain. So I tried that in my little lab at the university with the philosophy campus. 
not really knowing what I was doing, but it worked. And so now I had, for the first time, an insured supply of very potent psilocybin mushrooms. So I became quite enthusiastic about that. I was growing these mushrooms at home and, uh, and, and taking them fairly regularly. So I wrote to Schultes and I said, uh, I don't want to work on Varola anymore. I want, I would rather work on mushrooms. <laughs> and, and he wrote back, uh, a fairly terse letter. I don't know whether he was offended or what, but he wrote back a terse letter and he said, you know, I'm a taxonomist trained in the taxonomy of higher plants. Um, if you want to study mushrooms, you should contact uh, Dr. Alexander A. Smith at the University of Michigan. And, that was pretty much it. So I don't know whether he was offended or what, but uh, at any rate, uh, I, I, as it turned out, I was not accepted to Harvard and whether Schulte, you know, withdrew his support or I suspected just, I really didn't have the qualifications to be accepted into Harvard. So the dream of going to Harvard kind of faded at that point, but it, as later events turned out, uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. You're listening to the Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. And wasn't I lucky to find such a cliffhanger statement as, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me, <laughs> where I cut it off. Uh, and that was almost exactly halfway through this interview. Uh, but now, uh, before I say anything else, let me uh, comment about our old nemesis sound quality. So, before the emails start coming in, let me say ahead of time that, yes, uh, I too can hear the hum in the recording that we just listened to. And, uh, yes, I not only am aware of the noise reduction function in Audacity, believe it or not, I spent several hours cleaning up this recording to the point where it is now, uh, even though it leaves a lot to be desired. Now, there's hardly a month that goes by without someone getting in touch with me and offering to help cleaning up these tapes. And from time to time, I've tried to take advantage of those offers, but my lack of organization and planning skills has prevented me from effectively using these uh, wonderful offers of assistance. In fact, our fellow saloner Jason P. even went to the trouble of cleaning up a couple of the Palenque tapes that I still haven't gotten around to podcasting. Uh, not because of his most excellent work, but because once the tapes were made listenable, I decided that their content uh, really wasn't something that would hold your interest right now, and so they're still sitting there in reserve for some time in the future when their topics are a little bit more pertinent. But now I've got a situation where, without some help, we're going to miss some really important interviews, and in a moment I'll tell you what I'm thinking about how to fix this, but uh, first let me tell you the story of the recording that we just heard and about the other recordings that uh, came along with it. A few weeks ago I heard from our fellow saloner Hector Glass, who at the present time is what I would call a traveling artist, and although Hector's home is in Switzerland, He's been on the road for a bit, and uh, when he was in the Amazon researching ayahuasca, he met Peter Gorman, the writer who conducted the interview that we just heard. And they struck up a friendship, and Hector wound up visiting Peter at his home in North Texas. And uh, that's where Hector learned that Peter had made several recordings of his interviews with some people that you and I are always interested in hearing from. The one with Dennis McKenna that we are in the middle of right now was one of them, and was about the only one that I could even come close to uh, cleaning up the audio on. As you can imagine, uh, a hot Texas garage is probably not the best place in the world to store audio tapes. Now here are the names of uh, the other people whose interviews Hector digitized from those dusty old audio tapes. Uh, Ken Babs of Merry Prankster fame, Timothy Leary, Laura Huxley, Martin Lee, Mark McLeod, Oscar Janiger, Terrence McKenna, Richard Evans Schultes, and Dr. Albert Hoffman. And uh, I think there may even be one or two others. So you can tell that Hector discovered a real treasure trove of audio in Peter's garage that day, but most of the recordings suffered a lot of deterioration and are uh, really beyond my capability of cleaning up. 
And so I'm going to post a segment of one of the worst cases of this tape, uh, along with the program notes for this podcast, uh, which, of course, you know you can find via psychedelicsalon.us. Uh, and you'll find this section of audio in MP3 format, which is what it came in. And uh, I'll put it at the bottom of the program notes. And uh, if you think you can fix it, then just uh, download it, do your magic, and uh, send me an email to uh, let me know where I can download your cleaned up version. And we'll see if uh, you and I uh, think it's going to be clear enough to uh, podcast. Hopefully, uh, there will be several saloners who take up this challenge so that I can divide these recordings among you and not load up one person with a lot of work that may not be heard here in the salon for a while because, well, I've got a lot of other new things coming in also. As I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, uh, I've got a lot of other things I'd like to say right now, but I'm going to leave most of them for the next podcast, which will be the surprise conclusion of this interview with Dennis McKenna that we just heard. And did I just say it has a surprise? Uh, Well, I was quite pleasantly surprised, and I think that you will be too, uh, at least if you have secretly wanted to be a little critical of our dearly departed bard, Terrence McKenna, but uh, maybe we're a little too timid to speak ill of him. Uh, Well, we all have feet of clay, my friends, and I suspect that you'll find it quite refreshing to know that even our heroes are not that much different from you and me in many respects. So uh, stay tuned, and I'll get that out soon. Now, the one thing uh, that I still should say, uh, at least mention briefly before I go, is the workshop that Bruce Damer and I will be leading at the Outlook Inn on Orcas Island, which is an hour or so ferry ride out of Seattle. Uh, And the dates for the workshop are Friday night, September 30th, all day Saturday, October 1st, and possibly a morning session on Sunday, October 2nd. And uh, in my next podcast, I'll have more to say about that event. In closing, I'd like to let the people of Norway, and in particular all of our fellow saloners in that wonderful country, know how deeply saddened I am about the tragedy that you are living through right now. And while it may seem that way out here on the west coast of North America, we may be far removed from those horrific events, but... We really aren't removed from them at all. You know, we're all in this together right now, and these are very difficult times that we're living through. But great changes of ages are always like that. So hang in there, dear friends, and uh, we are most definitely with you and send our healing love your way. In fact, uh, this may be a good time to close a podcast with a bit of uplifting music that comes to us from our dear friend Andre Nobles, who... I featured along with his wife, Missy, in podcast number 182, The Spark of Divine Creativity. Now, the uh, song I'm going to play right now is from his new album, Bring the Joy Back, which is uh, one of the new Paradigm Free Lease albums. And I'll link to Andre's website in the program notes for today's program so that you can download it if you'd like to. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends.
upon yourselves to be heard Cause we're all counting on you And this world is what you're gonna go through For us all Time, you will find the way that shines, and in time you'll know why you are here, and what is this indigo? Stars, and then you open.